Hi everybody, my name is Jamie Harbin and I work at Dalhousie University. Hi, I'm Dan Kelly. I also work at Dalhousie University. So today what we are going to do is we're going to show our seventh video um, of our Argo Floats package. And today we are going to show how to do a map with bathymetry. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to head over to my R studio. Well, I thought I was going to go now, Jamie. Oh, okay. I'll take it away, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well organized here. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <coughs> sorry. Okay, so I think you can see my screen there. So, um, right, so I'm in our studio here, and I'm just going to show you something for the moment. This is not going to be within Argo Floats, it's going to be within another package. Uh, to do oceanographic stuff called OCE. And in OCE, there's a built-in data set named, I think, Argo. And, um, well, you can do a summary of Argo and see stuff about it. And there's interesting stuff in here, but I won't, I won't go into it. We, we could have a whole, a whole series about uh, how you use OCE. But uh, the Argo Floats package leans on OCE to do a lot of uh, work. So it's not a, probably a bad thing for you to see that. Now there's a plot method. Um, it's an object-oriented scheme here. And so if I say plot, and then uh, I give a variable, what R does is it looks at the variable and it sees what, what it is. In this case, it's a particular object in the OCE class of objects. And it says, oh, that's an Argo type. And so when I do plot, it will call a particular function. I'll show you what that function will do. That function plots uh, what you see here. So this is a trajectory plot. And this is a particular Argo float and um, the number of it, I'm scrolling in this, the number of it is 6900388. And by the magic of magic, Jamie's gonna remember that. <laughs> that's, that's a joke. Anyway, so you can see here, the circles are where the float was at different uh, times. This time it's rising and falling about every 10 days. So just think of those as being about every 10 days. And I think you can see from this that the, well, the float stays in the water for one. Uh, unlike in our previous uh, um, video, where the float down near the uh, Bahamas was sort of meandering around almost aimlessly, I would say, um, this one is not. And if you're familiar with oceanography, you'll know that this uh, uh, is in the region, this float is in the region of what's called the subpolar gyre, the North Atlantic subpolar gyre. And in this gyre, flow goes uh, in this direction. If you follow the mouse, it goes in that direction, which I guess would be called the counterclockwise or the anticlockwise direction, depending on where you're from. It's hard in this representation to see where exactly it starts. We, I could color code it by day or something, and you could see that perhaps. That might be a neat thing to do. There's also some weirdness going on here, like what? what the, that doesn't seem to be part of the gyre motion. It's very strange. <laughs> to my way of thinking. So um, the gyre motion is driven by uh, the, basically the curl of the wind stress is what's causing the, forcing the thing. And, um, and it's made, mainly making a kind of a, a well, gyre-like uh, motion there. But bathymetry clearly plays a role. This current doesn't go up on the land, it doesn't go up in Greenland. And it um, seems to me that we should probably have a look at the bathymetry the OCE package at the moment doesn't have a good way of showing bathymetry in such a plot, but the Argo floats package does. So I'm going to now hand it over to Jamie and she's basically gonna use this float ID and she's gonna show how, how you can do a much better analysis in the Argo floats uh, package. So I'm stopping my share now. Perfect. Now it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a lot of this is very similar to what we've done in our last video. Um, essentially, the only difference, as Dan mentioned, is to show bathymetry. But we will still go over the basic steps, um, just as a refresher. So lines one and two, all we're doing is loading the necessary packages. As Dan mentioned, our ID zero, as we call it, has the number 69003880. So again, that's just the same Argo that uh, we just looked at within the OCE package. So I'll make that line happen. So next, all we're doing is we're saying we are assigning index zero 
um, and we're subsetting the get index. So the get index, we're just using the defaults. So we're getting the core um, Argo data, and then we're just subsetting it for the ID. Um, so essentially just pulling out this specific Argo. And all we're saying here is if it um, doesn't exist, then, then get it. And if it does, we'll then carry on. So I'll just make that. Those I'll, just, I'll just interrupt for yeah. a second while it's loading because it takes maybe 20 seconds to load. The reason we do that is if you're running your code uh, in an interactive session and running it over and over, like by clicking on the source thing, that prevents you, it prevents this 20, 30 second downloading of a 35 megabyte file. Um, so if you were to run the whole code again, it wouldn't do what it just did. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. So now what we're doing, again, we've shown this numerous times now, we are just using what we call the square bracket, square bracket method, which is just extracting the lawn, the lat, the profile, and then as well as the time. So now we're just saying um, that we do, if it's not interactive, we want to create a PNG file. And we're just, uh, this part here is really just the aesthetic. So setting the parameters and the point size, and different variables like that. Now line 15, all we're doing, very simple, we're just setting our margins. Again, more of just kind of an aesthetic um, command here that we're doing. And then here in line 17, we are using color map, which we did demonstrate um, in the last video. But again, just for, um, oh, that's not how you spell color. <laughs> there we go, so really, just for a review and a little refresher, it just maps values to colors for use in palettes and plots. So here, all we're saying is we want to color code by time, which as you see, we extract it in line 10, and we are just using this built-in color set um, within the OCE package. So I'll make that line happen. Now, again, the same as, as the last video, all we're doing in line 18 is just drawing the palette. And we're saying that we want the color map to be um, essentially color coded by time again. And Dan did explain uh, what this time format is. Do you wanna go into that again, Dan, or just let the viewers watch the last video? Well, briefly, it's just going to give, it's using a standard scheme in, in R for times. It's just going to give four digits for the year dash two digits for the month. Perfect. And then we're just setting the position as to where we want to draw that color palette. So we'll make that line happen. Now, this is where the fun stuff happens and where things get a little different compared to the last video. All we're doing is we're subsetting our index zero, which is just that specific Argo ID. And this time we're gonna do bathymetry equals true. So Dan, before I make this plot happen, I'll get you to just describe where we are pulling the bathymetry from. Right, so we're getting it from uh, a NOAA, that's the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, um, a NOAA website. And it's and this website provides something called ETOPO1, that's a, uh, the elevation topography, I guess, is what E stands for. And one means one minute. One minute is one nautical mile, about 1.8 uh, kilometers. Um, so that, what it says is that it's a, a, a water depth or land depth, we ignore the land, uh, about every uh, uh, two kilometers in the ocean. These are not direct observations. It's a blend between some direct observations by soundings from ships done by acoustic means and, uh, and also some satellite methodologies. It's quite a fascinating uh, topic, and you'll see in a minute that the field's fascinating, but it would, take, it would take such a long time to even come close to talking about how it was derived that I won't try to do it. Um, but the great thing is that uh, you can download from that server bathymetry on that one uh, minute, one minute of lawn and let, uh, or four minutes or eight minutes or 20 minutes. And what plot is going to do is it's going to look at the span of the data the geographical span of the data and it's going to subset or ask for a reasonably coarse and view of the bathymetry such that there'll be maybe roughly about 500 points in the lawn direction and 500 in the y direction so if you uh I'll back to you jamie okay sounds good so now prepare to be amazed <laughs> <laughs> so it's this downloading the database if you do it again on the same grid, it, 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 that'll be fast. You won't have to download it. 
I'm using the Marmat. Well, we're using the Marmat package to, to load up the data. Thank you. Okay, so voila. I will continue and then I'll get um, Dan to explain a little bit of what's happening, but essentially all that's happening in line 20 is um, we're just putting points of the Latin lawn and we are just color coding by time. So that's all this BG command is doing is um, color coding by time. In line 21, once that happens, just takes a second. <laughs> it's on progress. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Perfect. And then line 21, we're really just connecting the dots to show the trajectory. Line 22, all we are doing is we're taking the length of the data and we're doing subset um, by 10, so for every 10. And then we use that in line 23 to just write the profile numbers of every 10th profile. So you'll see that pop up on the map now. And again, we did this in the last video as well. Just may take a second. Keep the system. So this is not typical, this delay. Is there something funny going on? Yeah. Not only that just pops up instantaneously. <laughs> and then the last thing that I'll just do here in line 24 is just to, to put the um, the quote number on the plot, which again will take a minute, but it usually does not. <laughs> well, I can talk then, maybe. Um, yeah, so that's the float number. Yeah, so anyone who's watching, I don't really know what's going on with Jamie's computer, but um, yeah, normally all those steps happen very quickly, so don't be put off by that. It normally doesn't take 20 seconds to write a text string on the screen. Right. <laughs> um, the, the, your computer didn't sleep well last night, and it's, it hasn't had any yeah. um, Maybe I'll talk a little bit about, uh, maybe, Jamie, could you put the mouse by the 001? By the zero zero one. Um, yep, right. there we go. So that's the first profile. So you can see from that, that's where the Argo float was uh, released. And it went in the, I always say these words wrong, but it went in the west direction roughly. And then it started going southward. And I think that you should be able to see in the video that uh, there's a light color there. And that means that the water is a little shallower there. Uh, it's a very interesting plate tectonics thing about mid-ocean ridges. So basically water doesn't want to cross, uh, oh, and this float is at one kilometer depth and it's more or less following with whatever the water's doing at one kilometer depth. And uh, water mostly wants to follow along a line of constant, well, F divided by H, where F is the Coriolis parameter and H is the water depth. But in a limited domain, you could say, or at a constant latitude, you could say it wants to follow at a constant depth. I would say that's why it's sort of taken that little jiggy jag down toward the south there. You can see that it's going along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and then it goes back up on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and then it joins the gyre. And now it goes around at position 51. It's at the southern tip there of, uh, of Greenland. And it's taking then a cycle through the, that's called the Labrador Sea there. Um, and now it's going south where the mouse is at the moment, those green colors, it's going south along the Labrador and then Newfoundland regions. Um, the very bottom there, I'm not sure if I can, if you know where it is, but Jamie, just go to the white, to the white, the Flemish cap is what I'm thinking. Do you know where that is? Just I to, do not know. to the right a little wee bit. No, nope, right there, yeah, that's Flemish cap. And um, so basically around Flemish cap, uh, what it does is it starts going more or less toward east. Now, it's not seeing any bathymetry there. What it's seeing is that it's, that's what the gyre does, because this is the gyre location is determined by something about the, the uh, wind stress uh, on the ocean. Um, and that's kind of a physical oceanography thing that I guess I won't get into. But Jamie, can you trace it back up to the red ones now? Sure. So the red ones, it's coming into the gyre. And again, look at it. You just... Oh, I don't really want to cross over that ridge. And now it goes south along the ridge for a while. And uh, then finally it crosses across the ridge and it seems to be wanting to continue. This is all the data that we have. I guess that float must have died at that point. And after all, if you look at the number of years, 
uh, the poor little guy or girl, whatever it is, uh, lasted for quite a long time before yeah. before it kind of ran out of juice and fell to the bottom and became pollution. <laughs> um, anyway, so the so the point I guess of this video is that you can learn an awful lot um, by looking at the bathymetry, and to my mind, uh, this is just a, as a physical oceanography uh, aficionado. Um, this is just a beautiful demonstration of what's called geostrophic or quasi geostrophic dynamics. Um, and the other is even if you don't like that kind of physics stuff, I just think that this. This bathymetry is just, just gorgeous. Um, maybe if you could put your mouse along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Jamie. Okay. So uh, you can see that the shallow region in the center of the ridge, which, like a ridge valley, I guess that that's called. And then just go down a little bit more. Okay. And right there, and there's the transverse fault, that jiggy jaggy where it went over east-west. Just go up a little north from there. Yeah, right there, you're oh, in yeah. the transverse fault. And you can see that. So anyone who's interested in geology, you, I think you could stare at these things endlessly. Um, right, so uh, I hope we've made the point that it's useful to, um, to see bathymetry in these trajectory plots. And that's the reason why the default value of bathymetry in line 19 is actually true. And you didn't actually have to put that bathymetry equals true there, it would have happened by default. And if you don't like the bathymetry color map or the bathymetry data set or anything about it, you can give a more sophisticated uh, value for the bathymetry argument and uh, just do question mark plot, just get the normal help anyway on plot and it will tell you how to do that with some examples. So I think that's what we wanted to cover, wasn't it, Jamie? That is everything. Well, good. So this is Dan Kelly signing off. And Jamie Harbin signing off. Take care and tune in for our next uh, video. Bye-bye.